to any man is in Christ is a new creature. So why do I still feel the same? Why, I, why do I still think the same? Why, why do I look at myself and just still see that really not much has changed sometimes? Why is it that we don't make the transition? We become someone new, but we still don't know that person. We don't make the transition because we are more familiar with the old man. I'm more familiar with the old Yemi. You are more familiar with the old Kumbi. She's more familiar with the old Chika. You're more familiar. We're just more familiar with the old man. So we are comfortable with the old man, his habits, especially his thinking habits, his self-image, and the new man is nothing but just then an idea in our head. We know who we are in Christ as head knowledge, but not with a deep sense of identity. Thank you, Jesus. So question again, how do we then translate the knowledge of who we are in Christ from where a mere head knowledge to a deep sense of identity and the right self-image. One of the things I, I, I was asking myself in preparing for this message is, why does it sometimes, why does it seem like the word of God produces results in the lives of some believers and doesn't produce results in others? In order for the word of God to bear fruit, it must first take root. It cannot bear fruit without taking root. So this message is about to show us how we can take root, how the world can take root in our lives so it can then bear fruit. As Christians, many of us, we don't have an awareness problem. It's not that we don't know. We know stuff, but the problem most of, of the time is that we are not being changed by what we know. There's a difference between head knowledge and knowledge that affects your sense of personal identity in an active way. John 8, 32 says, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now the word know there, as I often emphasize, this is another one of those words where the word know has a Greek name called Ginosko. And I was reading from an author um, he says, let me just read what the author says about the word ginosko, because many times when you hear the word no in the New Testament, lots of times it's this root word ginosko, G-I-N-O-S-K-O. -O. Sometimes has, it has a quite variety of application, according to this author, depending on context. Ginosko is one of those major verbs of the Bible, and because of its numerous uses in the New Testament, it's not surprising that the Greek lexo lexicographers ascribe a number of nuances of meaning, including uh, these meanings, to get to know something, or to have intimate relations with, or to know by experience as against mere awareness, or just awareness. So it's experience, not just awareness. It's an experiential knowledge. It's to experience something. It's to be intimate with something. So then when the Bible says you will know the truth, John 8, 32, and the truth, the truth will set you free. It's not just about being aware of the truth, but being intimate with the truth. So when I say I know the truth, um, contextually it means I am intimate with the truth. And that's different from I'm aware, from saying I'm aware of the truth. So that scripture can actually be quoted as you shall be intimate with the truth and the truth shall set you free. Which means if it's not setting you free, you're not yet that intimate with it. Because the force, and listen to this carefully, the force that makes it active enough to effect change is generated only through intimacy. That kind of knowledge doesn't stay in your head. It's the kind that goes deep into your subconscious mind and changes your sense of identity. It's called active knowledge, not passive knowledge. 
It comes by meditating on the word of God to the point where it doesn't just stay in your head. It goes deep down to the faculty that's responsible for your self-image and changes it. it. It practically makes you a new picture of you. It makes you a picture of yourself in a new way of being. You see yourself in a whole new way. And this is how it happens. When you take the word of God and you imagine potential situations ahead of time, you imagine how you are going to react before it actually happens. Over times, when you're doing that, constantly you are forming a whole new model of you, inside of you, that's going to reflect on the outside. This is how the word of God takes root in your life. And how it goes from mere head knowledge to a deep sense of identity. It changes your idea of you. It rewrites a new sense of identity. It, it hard codes a new you into your subconscious mind. It changes your intuitive habits. Makes you see yourself in a new way. Makes you see yourself acting in a new way even before the situation occurs. So that when it occurs, you already practice your victory ahead of time. Wow. You already know ahead of time what you are going to do when the situation occurs. Oh, glory to God. You know what? David told Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, verse 46, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I will strike you down and cut off your head this very day, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army. What God? I will give the carcasses of Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know. This guy has not thrown the stone yet. My God. This is a testimony of someone who knows his God. The Bible says, they that know their God, they shall be strong and do great exploits. David already saw it. David already saw himself in victory. You've got to see yourself in victory. Sometimes all we imagine is defeat. All we imagine is negativity because it's convenient to think, to, 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 to think of the worst case scenario. My goodness. And sometimes in the convenience of our thinking habits, when we're thinking the worst case scenario, we fail to see ourselves in victory and we have a habit, it becomes an, an intuitive rule, inbound, outbound rules in our subconscious mind that doesn't make us see ourselves in victory. When the devil starts to suggest to you, what if the check doesn't come in? What are you going to do? You answer and say, oh yeah, I'm going to rejoice in the Lord as though I already got the check. You already saw yourself in victory ahead of the event. When the enemy comes and says, what if they leave you and walk out of your life? And you, uh, you answer immediately and say, I'm going to have a great time. I'll experience the joy of the Lord in a whole new way, singing unto the Lord because I know he's with me because he said in his word, is he will never leave me nor forsake me, that he's the friend who sticks closer than a brother. That's because you've seen yourself in it. What if you, what the enemy comes to you and says, oh, what if they fire you out of the company or they say to you, you can no longer, we can no longer afford you, we are sorry, we're going to have to let you go. Uh, and you answer the devil and say, oh yeah, that would be a perfect opportunity to experience divine providence from God, just like the children of Israel experienced the falling of manna from heaven. Now, my goodness, you tell yourself, I, I will experience the goodness of God even in the wilderness. Just like David said, I will remain confident in this, that I will see the goodness of the Lord. My heart will not fear because he that watches over me neither sleeps nor slumbers. So revelation prepares you for situations. The devil is always going to try to whisper negativity to you. It does it to everyone, both the righteous and the unrighteous, both the young and old, both mature and young Christians. There is no immunity against negativity. It comes to everyone. 
The only antidote is to keep your mind busy on the word of God. The Bible says, it shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So see yourself in it. Wow, my God is going to supply my needs in, according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. This is me visualizing myself in it. In the, in the, in, according to his riches in glory, wow. In, in Christ Jesus, according to his riches, if a, man, if a rich man says they want to write you a check, you already know what to expect. Somebody who owns heaven and earth said to you that he will supply all your needs according to what? His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. When you're too bu when you're busy visualizing yourself in this, you're too preoccupied for the negativity of the devil because your mind is not idle. He said he will keep in perfect peace those whose hearts are what? Stayed on him. That's Isaiah 26, 3. And how long do we do this for? As long as you need. As long as you need. If you have to do that 10 times daily, go ahead. If you have to do that every moment, go ahead. If you have to put it as a screensaver on your phone or your tablet to where you see it every five minutes, go ahead. My goodness. That's what it takes. The, the Lord said to Joshua in Joshua 1, 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. The word of God has to take root and get to the place where you don't just know it for awareness sake, but where it changes your sense of identity. Jesus told a parable in Matthew 4, especially uh, verses 5 and 6, talking about a, man, a farmer going to sow in his field. And that um, when he sowed, uh, the wind blew, and uh, some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up, but it had no depth of earth. That's what the issue, that's the struggle of many of us Christians. The world has no depth of earth. The world does, it falls down, but we keep we, 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 we sow the word in a seed, but we take it out and reconsider it and put it back. And when you keep taking a seed out of the ground and plant it again and check it again, whether it's, 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 it's growing and put it back in the ground and check it again to see if it's growing and put it back in the ground, it never really grows. That's why it says, except that corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abided alone. But if it falls down to the ground and dies, it begins, if we leave it in the ground enough, where is this ground? Our hearts. Then it begins to take root. And that is such amazing. It begins to take root that it begins to change its shape. And it begins to change the structure of the heart. It begins to rewire your thinking. It begins to rewire your self-image. It begins to rewire your sense of identity. It begins to rewire you, you and it begins to kick out all the intuitive fear. Because lots of times we talk about fear. When we talk about fear, we think we're talking about fright. Like, oh, I will not be afraid. No, that's not it. Lots of times this fear is the one that seeps deep deep down on the bottom of people at people's hearts controlling their daily decisions without even any consciousness of it it's intuitive fear there are many decisions we've made out of intuitive fears that we don't even know why this is why we make that decision there are times we correct our kids in intuitive fear there are times we we make decisions in our marriages in intuitive fear there are times we make career decisions out of intuitive fear. But these are the things that the word of God begins to change when we begin to see ourselves in a new light. The quality of our decisions will be better. The quality of our, of our lives will generally in turn become better because of it. So he said, and some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth and immediately it sprang up and it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched and because it had no root, it withered away. This is the reason why some Christians seem to have uh, fruit. The word of God seems to work in the lives of some people and some other people, it seems like it doesn't work. Somebody said, oh, I, uh, an author said that somebody said to them that they, they tried the word and it didn't work. And said, he told the person, no, the word tried you and you didn't work. 
because the word of God works. That's right. The word of God works. The Bible talks about Joseph, that until his change came, that the word, the word of God tried him. And Joseph walked when the word of God tried him because when he was with Potiphar's wife, he refused to compromise. So the word of God has to, for it to have more effect, it has to take more root than it has right now. And the question I want every one of us to ask ourselves right now is, how can the word of God take a deeper root in me than it does right now? To the place where I see myself the right way. Nothing worries me. Nothing bothers me. <laughs> nothing shakes me. Nothing moves me. Where I can fall asleep in the middle of a storm like Jesus, and for any reason I awake in the middle of the storm, I can rebuke the storm. Do you know that's the quality of life that Jesus has given to us by his death and resurrection on the cross? where we know, we see how the election is going and how the nation is going, and we're not even moved because we know that God is able to take care of us and we are not afraid of anything. No outcome will shake us. That is the life that God has called you to live. That's the life God has given you, but you need to activate it through the active knowledge, not just mental awareness, but revelation knowledge and a deep sense of identity. And it comes by actively, actively dwelling in the word of God, seeing yourself through the lenses of scripture <laughs> and imagining yourself in a whole new way. That's, the, that's, the, that's what God has called us to. And that is the blessing, the life, the, the life of God. The Bible says that for God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall have everlasting life. Some, some versions say eternal life. And if you read in the original meaning, it's not uh, everlasting life in the context of living with Christ forever and ever and ever more, reigning with him eternally. That is true, but that's not even the context. It's talking about, in the original meaning, it's talking about the life of the eternal one, the life of God. So it's more of a quality of life than a duration of life that we may have zoe, that's what, that's the, the Greek word for it. That we may, that for everyone that whosoever believes in him shall have zoe. It is the life of the eternal one, the life of God. That's the kind of life that God has, that's the gift God has given us. The one that you hear by news, you just say, oh, okay, there, it's gonna be okay. And you take up your blanket, you, you turn around and you sleep, you get to sleep. So why are you not losing sleep? I'm not losing sleep because I know that my God is able to do, make all grace abound towards me. You should be worried by now about this. And then, no, no, no. I am not moved. I shall not be moved. The righteous shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season. That is, when that becomes like an identity, how you see yourself, it's, it goes from head knowledge. I think the gap we have in, in, the, in the Christendom, in church, is when we get born again, we're excited about it, but for so many years, people, many people get stuck in this gap where we just know the word, but it's not an active reality. It's not taking root to the point where it changes our self um, image and identity. I hope this has been a blessing.